Niklas, welcome back. Thank you very much. It's been a while, and you've been up to some crazy growth in between. <laughs> One of the COVID winners. Yeah, I don't know if I would say that, because maybe we're short-term COVID winners, but at some point COVID is gone, uh, so I think growth was also coming down a little bit. So it was also a rough journey, uh, uh, the whole COVID and return from it. I mean, some of the stats we've already heard, but um, just to it, repeat. Nine million orders a day, not billion orders, I think. Uh, only nine million nine orders, million. only millions. Yeah. Um, but billions in terms of sales, um, you're at, what, 40 billion Uh, plus in sales, um, 11 billion market cap. I mean, you are truly one of the biggest successes that we have in Europe. Um, so congrats for that. Um, I also saw that the market size, the opportunity for you as a company that you had sized in one of your earlier pitch decks was 16 billion, which is already, you know, big and sizable. Um, so how often did you have to update your original pitch deck? Oh. I, I think I forgot about it, and I looked back then, I don't know, 10 years later, and I realized, like, wow, we were really conservative. I thought I was the bullish person in the room, and obviously we were not. Uh, so, so we thought that we could build a billion-dollar business uh, over 10 markets, and that we can generate a billion or so in sales. But, yeah, we are 46 billion right now. So. And, and what do you think? Like, was it a sort of market sizing question, or have you also totally outperformed you know, in that given market. You obviously had sort of a roll-up strategy um, with uh, lots of M&A uh, and scaling really across the world. Like, what was it? Yeah, and we, we, we did take on a lot of capital, so we did raise a lot of funds. Uh, How much in so total? I don't know, okay. I don't know. Uh, a, f a couple of billion, and then we have taken on also a, a convertibles and other mm -hmm. instrument, but maybe a couple of billion in, 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 in equity capital. Um, I think the biggest difference from what we thought is that we looked at the current market size when we made the prediction, and I think we didn't expect that we would grow the market so much. And I think well, as soon as we started delivering our own, so we had our own delivery riders, we started able to add much better restaurant. I think when we started, it was almost just a pizza, maybe some, some sushi you can get delivered, and now you can get like anything you want. Uh, not only food, but you can get groceries, you can get uh, flowers, uh, electronics, uh, whatever you want. So I think the fact that we expanded also the market and the, uh, yeah. And, you know, speaking of that sort of, you know, last mile delivery, 15 minute delivery, I mean, you know, you, you've, you kept on having to fight off new competitors, probably just when you thought it was over and you've won the delivery war, all these new 15 minute delivery companies uh, would, would pop up. Uh, was that something that you had anticipated coming or were you also surprised by that? No, no. It's, it's, it was also hard because you build something, you feel like, ah, finally we can get to profitability and everyone was kind of asking when you get profitable and suddenly Uber or someone come, Travis Kalanick coming and just investing tens of billions into the food and you'd be like, uh, we had to postpone the plans around another five, six years or so because of that. And then uh, more and more players come into our industry. Grab, of course, which is a ride-hailing company mm -hmm. in, in Southeast Asia. Then you had e-commerce companies like Coupang, which is a, a big Amazon of Korea. Uh, Trendyol, uh, Karim. Um, so, so it was endless of new comparisons coming in. Uh, so, so a little bit exhausting. But you know your enemy names well. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I know their families, I know their kids, I know all of them. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, it, it, it's been, you kind of had to dig deep many times because you start up and you work so hard to get to that goal. Yeah. And then the goalpost kind of moves forward and you feel like, ah, now I have to fight again and again and again. And then the, the financial, I, I don't know, we... We were worth, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, uh, probably 35 billion at, yep. at, at the moment. Uh, now May it's soon be worth 25 so. billion again, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now we're down, and of course, it it's really sucks to, to sit in a public stock when it drops 75%, mm -hmm. and your investors will be like, what the hell are you doing? And your employees and all of that. So mm -hmm. it's been, it's not been a, only an easy journey. It's been a lot of hills on the way. Uh, yeah. 
and and when you saw, I mean, when we look at things like 15-minute delivery, how much of you were saying like this is just you know quantitative easing gone rogue? Um, this doesn't make sense on a numbers perspective, on unique economics perspective. I mean, there's this running joke in Silicon Valley, right, that you can get everything delivered in 15 minutes, and you know, you have all these services, but they're ultimately VC subsidized. And I think we've all had the experience probably with Ubers where we would be like, oh, Uber is amazing. It's so cheap, you know, like I will never use a cab anymore. And now in New York, it's pretty much always more expensive than a taxi. Yeah. Um, you, you know, how is that also on a timeline you think, you know, will we have to get used to increased prices for as a customer? I think for us, no. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have the size and the scale, uh, but I think on the question, it was clearly also back then that there's a lot of money coming in. Mm. But the problem is when you are in this hype cycle, you cannot just ignore it and say, well, that's all stupid and we're not going to do it. Because the hype cycle can continue for one year, five years, I don't know, mm -hmm. for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if someone builds something 10 minutes, mm -hmm. it might not have economics in one year, but if they're able to raise 5 billion mm -hmm. and build scale, maybe they will be able to pivot it one moment to profitability. So you, you on the one hand, you, you hate it a little bit. You'll be like, this makes no sense. Now, now we have to do the same and, and burn billions of money to, to, to kind of have this product offering. And, and, but, but at the same, yeah. But does the product make sense? Does 15-minute delivery, can that actually be unit economic profitable? How do you think about it? Or will we eventually, does it only make sense once you have more robots, autonomous, you know, driving cars, delivering these deliveries? You could with scale, you, mm -hmm. you could get 10, 15 minutes delivery profitable. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident on that. But it's just a matter how much will customers pay mm -hmm. in delivery fee to compensate for that speed. And can you build that scale and size? Mm -hmm. How much will it cost you to bring that scale mm -hmm. and size? Um, and I, I think the answer is that it, it will cost a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it costs us a little bit less because we have the customers mm -hmm. and we can still drive. I think the question is rather, would customers trade off paying one euro less mm -hmm. but getting it delivered in 20 or 25 minutes? Yep. And I think they do. Yep. So we have probably moved from a 10, 15 minutes to a 20, 25 minutes yep. delivery. And we can make that economical uh, yep. not on, on cash flow basis. Yep. Uh, Who's in checking? some markets. Who's checking anyway? Like I've had a few of these deliveries now and in the end it's like five yeah. minutes late. I mean, no, a it, 20 it, yeah. minute delivery is incredible. Yeah, and, and, and I think there is also a lot of we are profitable and, yeah. and so on. And then this still bottom line is still mm -hmm. a burn of 500 million. So, so I, I think we've all heard those stories and uh, we are also not profitable. Mm -hmm. It will be areas and, and so on. So, uh, but but I'm, I'm still, I feel pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also happy if no one else believes in it mm -hmm. because it's, it's yeah, that, that helps me to build slowly in, in peace. Yeah, your uh, doubt is my opportunity. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so. um, before we speak a little bit about your path to profitability, you know, also some you know, your, of your personal learnings, um, I've been an avid Twitter follower. Um, you've been tweeting uh, lots of your learnings lately um, for early stage and maybe later stage startup founders. Um, how should we think about like the future of delivery and do you have like a lab? Are you working literally on drone deliveries already? Like how, how much are you thinking about it and, and dedicating resources to that question? We do. So we do have uh, both tests on drones as well mm -hmm. as robotics. I think robotics we are much more advanced in, mm -hmm. uh, but we do it very targeted. So with robotics, we work in Korea, we deliver in certain areas or in certain segments uh, autonomously. Still, someone needs to walk them or sit on a screen. I think by next year, Q1, regulation will change and we can actually do it without. And they will go through elevators, mm -hmm. they will... Uh, um, and know their way through the buildings and so on. So it, it, it really works. But again, it's in a area that is made for that, where we have been programming the, the elevators and, 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 and the robotics and our yes systems of those, uh, those mm -hmm. robots. So the question is, how will that scale when you go out to a street like this, where everything is not, the, I don't know, it's not as predictable and planned, and then I think it will take a very long time. Um, but we do it, but I think 
it's still a very small part of what we do. I, I still like to do things that really have a customer mm -hmm. value today mm -hmm. and rather innovate small piece by piece. Uh, but yeah, some mood shots we still build on. And, and how much do you think of this is priced in on the public markets of your category of companies, you know, being able to get to a much more automated process and then follow up question, you know, generally you mentioned, you know, your market cap is down as of all of the, you know, uh, late tech companies um, that are not part of the fun, um, basically. Um, what's the state of kind of public sector tech companies in Europe? Like where we at, what's the timeline of recovery, you think? So, um, I think there is nothing that is priced in that, oh, if we do this differently, we can make more money and therefore we should have a high evaluation in the market. That, that, that was 2021, that people said, oh, in five years they can do this and therefore uh, that, that's not today. Today, anyone will value what you deliver today. Um, and, and they will not even say that you're making profit here, so I value this high and you make loss here, I value that to zero. They, they will literally do, what is the bottom line of everything? Mm -hmm. um, so if you take us, we make more than a billion of EBITDA uh, and, and close to a billion of cash flow in our profitable markets, including group cost allocation and all of that. But we probably get a lot of negative value that we burn a billion in, um, in some markets or in quick commerce and DMARS and so on that we build. And that means that the bottom line is just a couple of hundred millions of EBITDA. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the underlying fundamental of evaluation. I don't mind it. it it's fine. Uh, eventually, those markets go to profit, and then hopefully we will have the upswing in valuation again. So I think for us, it's just to stay calm and execute what we believe in and invest behind the product. Still do. A lot of people don't believe in quick commerce. They will, they will probably rather see us not doing it. But we think it's great, and we think it's a great customer experience, and we believe in it. So we, we are willing to take a 10 billion valuation hit by doing it. Mm -hmm. Because I think in one or two years, mm -hmm. we can hopefully tell a better story around it. Um, so um, so I, think, I think we feel pretty okay, and I'm, I'm very sure that a lot of tech companies are doing really well. But valuations are, of course, very compromised, and for some of them will be for good reasons, for others maybe not. And we'll see who's able to deliver on, on the promise, and, and yeah, let's see. But you're on path to free cash flow break even this year um, announced, and you know you just talked about you know how you have profitable markets, unprofitable markets. What is the sort of underlying criteria that is important to establish you know whether a market you know still makes sense to invest in, and what is also just out of interest sort of the like the actual like user demographic? I mean you know of <laughs> I guess in how similar is that in different markets? Is there sort of a, a global consumer or? I I think there is, I think the needs of the, everyone wants to have food and wants to have good food and wants it fast, but the behavior might still be that some markets are more used to get served and are more used to food and they've learned to like it and learned to appreciate it and it becomes part of the routine. They have their taco Thursday and sushi Friday and their, their coffee on weekdays and, and breakfast on whatever Sunday. And, and it's just part of how they, they live. And, for others, it's just a, still like, oh, every once a month we have a pizza night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I think they will realize that maybe that Taco Thursday is coming and, and, and eventually they will change the behavior. But some markets are probably a little bit behind in, mm -hmm. in that kind of a switch. Um, and I think what we see in general in, in mm -hmm. taking on that journey to profitability is that you need scale and size. Or you need to make a lot of margin on the order, but that we don't want to do. We want to go profitability through, through size. And on every order, let's say we make a little bit more than a euro of, mm -hmm. of contribution profit. And then we want to do a lot of orders. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, in an early stage, you might also not care for making, if you make your one euro 50 or if you make 50 cents, if you do small scale, mm -hmm. you might also not push that. But you rather, let's just grow, mm -hmm. accept that we might not be underpriced mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start getting size, you might optimize a little bit your logistics and other things to, to improve your gross profit. And on top of that, the scale then drives to the profitability. And, 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 and therefore, we feel comfortable that the markets are not yet there, have a clear path at least. And could you get more margin by, for example, I mean, this is just a wild you know, user idea, um, by 
you know, helping people with discovery in the sense of, you know, let's say somebody is diabetic or somebody, you know, is on a low inflammation diet or somebody is on keto diet and, you know, another person is on God knows what type of Atkins diet and, you know, like looking at really individual sort of eating behavior. I know you do some of that already, but is that a long tail that is worth exploring? Long term, we're definitely going to do a lot of that. Uh, as you said, maybe I'm on a diet that month and I want to have what are the best restaurants for me on a diet? Mm -hmm. uh, how can I get my green smoothie and salads mm -hmm. and, and uh, deliver it? So th there are definitely a need for mm -hmm. better search and personalization mm -hmm. and objectives that you have a consumer. And we, we, we're still mm -hmm. early on that. I think we can do a lot more. I think probably the main focus of us now is to make you realize that instead of just having that pizza evening, mm -hmm. Maybe you want to try that, uh, mm -hmm. know, again, Taco Thursday, or maybe you should try Starbucks coffee mm -hmm. uh, delivered, or maybe you should uh, test out the grocery shopping mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, sure. and you miss your milk at yeah. home or your toothpaste in the evening and you, you want to have it delivered. And mm -hmm. while you do that, you also order your apples and your bananas and your yogurt. And over time, that is more value for us to sure. get you as a consumer, understand yeah. the value that we can bring and then... Uh, but in 10 years, maybe I will have my kind of glucose tracker connected and you will tell me which of the orders will have what amount of sugar and, you know, kind of cater. Yeah, we are not yet the everyday app in that yeah. sense. We, we still, I don't know, people maybe order once a week. Yep. Uh, and, yep. and so that means one meal out of 30 or so. Yep. Yep. Uh, so still a, oh, wow. a, 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 That's, a, uh, if, if, still a lot of growth coming. Let's talk about AI, obviously. Um, you know, how do you think about it, you know, as a CEO, as a leader, you know, of such a large company, you know, we heard about, you know, just the staggering amount of employees that you have worldwide. I'm sure there must be, you know, some type of, you know, uncertainty, anxiety also among the workforce, you know, you know, does everybody have access to a chat GPT account? Like, you know, how are you thinking about implementing tools like that for your organization? So... Um of course, there's a lot of things that's going to dramatically change, and we can discuss the mm -hmm. timeline, but, mm -hmm. but uh, surely a lot of change is going to happen if we work for us and so on, uh, and, and how we work. It doesn't necessarily need to be, be less, although mm -hmm. that is also a likely possibility, but it would be different uh, mm -hmm. how you work and how you're structured. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we, we see like what areas can we do better, how can we do, I don't know, do faster mm -hmm. coding with CodePilot or Copilot, or how can we do better analysis or uh, more efficiency in our whatever accounting department. Mm -hmm. But I, even more important for me is to still do tangible stuff that I can see a direct effect on for our customers, uh, ideally, uh, instantly. And then, of course, there's a lot of things that we do that will dramatically improve the experience over the next three or six months. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. um, and Is this proprietary tech or are you leveraging, plugging into oh, we, we, other we platforms? We're leveraging yeah. the chat GPT and... and, and, and yeah. um, do we even have a chance tools. in Europe to build tools like this or do we just have to yet again, you know, plug into the AWS of AI, chat GPT, BART, etc.? Yeah, we, we probably have a chance. Yeah. There's probably going to be more tools. I don't know, it, it, chat mm -hmm. GPT was maybe the first, but there are probably a hundred of them. And mm -hmm. they're they, are, they are not that different. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be some who specialize in one area and one specialist in another area. Uh, some proprietary the data and so mm -hmm. on, so it's built. Um, so um, we have probably a chance, but it's probably more what you do with it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like... Yeah, you made a comparison to, mm. to cloud computing and AWS. I still think that ChatGPT and, and BARD and so on is more like a, 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 a cloud computing. But yeah. then the question is, what do you build on top of that cloud computing? Yeah. What are the services and functions and user products that can be built based on, mm -hmm. on, on that commodity? Mm -hmm. that, so, so I probably see it more as a commodity than mm -hmm. a, um, yeah, anything else. Let's shift gears a little bit towards the sort of you know, entrepreneurial learnings that you've come through and, you know, maybe some startup advice uh, to aspiring founders or existing founders out there. I mean, you've really done this incredible journey, right, throughout the years now, building such a, a big company. Like, how have you developed as a leader and, and, you know, what was the process like? Was it really baptism by fire or did you have good coaches and a structured process to it? I, I, I learned by my mistakes and those are many. Uh, I... I no, I realized how terrible I was then, and I still, if I look back, 
in 10 years, I hope I say the same thing about me now, uh, and I'm sure I will. Uh, but of course, there's been a lot of learnings. I, I started off being extremely micromanaging and running every single thing myself, uh, being giving no trust to anyone and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and maybe they had also value in the early stage that you really get to know what you're building and, and mm -hmm. how you're building and, and so on. But of course, over time, I, 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 I learned to hire better people. Mm -hmm. I learned to surround myself with better people. And, and of course, the day that you have someone who's better in an area is, mm -hmm. is an enormous relief. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, I'm super lucky. I have a team, the same team for a very long mm -hmm. time. They know me, they know my weaknesses, um, and they know what I want, uh, and they're better than me in every single area, and, and that makes my life pretty easy. Uh, and that enables me to maybe take a little bit of an overarching view or mm -hmm. making sure that the values are implemented or, or that, that being able to drill down in one or two areas to challenge mm -hmm. uh, and a certain ideas of the product or how it evolved from a, being a food delivery company to a delivery everything company, going deeper into the, mm -hmm. to the funnel as well in food delivery and so on. So. You s just mentioned values. Uh, I worked at Amazon um, Web Services um, at one point, and I remember, like, for me, you know, one of like the most astonishing things to witness was like how there were these cultural principles. Thirteen customer obsession, but also, you know, whatever, think big and, you know, be frugal and, you know, 13 of them um, and how they were not just sort of written somewhere on a website, but how they actually gave employees the freedom to take decisions with really very little management oversight, as long as one stuck to these cultural tenants. Um, is that something that you have, you know, implemented? We also have, um, but I think even more important is that the way we actually operate and how I act and how we mm -hmm. act. And, and I think if you come to deliver here, you, will, you, you can breathe the value of passion and entrepreneurship and let's do it and fast and uh, let's move on and impact. And, and you can feel that entrepreneurial drive and spirit mm -hmm. in its core. And I don't think it is because it's written on the wall, but it, it's mm -hmm. just how we like to operate and every discussion we have or every solution that we want to do. And, and, uh, so so I, I, I think we have a very strong culture of that, and some I like it. I, I love it. It's the best. But uh, um, Any jobs open? Always. <laughs> Anna, we, 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 He's selling it. We, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a fantastic company for, for making an impact. And, yeah. and um, I, I wonder, if, you know, like in a way to keep that culture in place, right, a lot of it depends on hiring and training. Right? I mean, and there's only so little you can do, I guess, on the hiring front. Uh, there's a lot you will have to eventually do on a, um, you know, I guess, decision on firing versus training and, and upskilling, you know, into new positions in the company. What are some of the, you know, very important, maybe questions even, very practically, that are important to you when, when you personally hire somebody and you go into that last conversation? It's, it's very hard with hiring. I, I I think I hired a lot through quality mm -hmm. in, in the beginning or like a, a content experience and so on. And I think over time I learned to be more, do, do they have that, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I can't even describe it, that willingness to drive, a teamwork, impact, smart. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so probably less than experience, uh, more, I don't know, do they have the drive and, mm -hmm. and do I enjoy working mm -hmm. with them? Because in the end, I, I, if I enjoy it, we're going to have a great time. Does it fit into the team? Mm -hmm. um, so. They're calling us off, but I want to ask two questions, so maybe we do them quick. One, my favorite question always, um, on pivoting. I asked it before to somebody else, um, but in my experience, talking to a lot of early stage founders, often, you know, the kind of the big important challenge that they face is this question of, am I on the right track? Should I just keep going, eventually iterate, iterate, iterate to product market fit and success? Or do I have to have more of a drastic change, pivot my product, pivot the market? I'm sure you've had moments in your career where you had that question, and, and I wonder, like, is there a process or framework or way of, you know, making a decision on that? I, I, I don't know. I, I feel, I f 
for us it was more like you know when you have it right yeah. and and that's the time when you can scale and that's the time when you know like this really works economics works mm -hmm. i can really see it mm -hmm. and and, and and now we can take money on it and actually scale it and go to the next mm -hmm. market. I wouldn't want to go into too many places mm -hmm. before you actually know that, that you have a fundamental I mean understanding of what you're doing. And then lastly, um, you know, having you know, built this company over so many years and I mean, just the thought of managing 50,000 people, um, how do you stay you know, sort of balanced you know, what is your practice? Is it a lot of sport, mindfulness? I know you're a family man. Um, and how do you also keep the desire to keep pushing? I, I do some sports. I try to make sure I do three, four times a week sports. I, I, I try to stay healthy. Uh, I think for me, what changed my stress level and, and so on was the day when I realized, like, I'm, I don't have to pretend. I am who I am. and and just try to stay myself. I, I think when you're in the beginning, you realize, whoa, I have no idea what I'm doing. I was manning a team of three, and now there are 150 of them. I, I have to be better than I am. I, I, I have to show that I'm a, a, a proper CEO. Uh, and I, I felt that that was a stress that we have, that you have to live up to something that you, mm -hmm. you, you, you feel like you're not yet. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point, I. I left that. I was also more transparent with my team. These are the problems. This is what I can do. These are the challenges with investors. And, and I, I think I became myself a little bit more. And for some reason, it suddenly had such a leap in the organization. Suddenly, people actually thought I was a better leader. And I think I was because I was authentic. I said what I thought. I, I didn't hold back. And, I, and, and somehow, I felt like if, as long as I, I don't have to pretend being someone, if it's not enough, then it's not enough, but at least I'm doing my best. And, and uh, I think that has been such a stress relief for me to, to operate. And we can find out more of such advice on Twitter. Um, <laughs> you're tweeting yourself? Yeah, I do, from time to time. I, I can't hold myself. I, I, <laughs> sometimes I should. But it's, it's really interesting because you do share a lot of sort of behind the scenes things about concrete examples of negotiations that you had, fundraising, etc., that I think can be very useful for founders to follow. Niklas, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. All the Bye. best. Big applause. Thank you.